The Polar Express is a movie that came out in 2004, and it's actually based on a children's book that was written in 1985. The film features human characters animated using live-action motion capture animation. Now, I know there are a lot of people who find this specific type of animation very creepy to look at. Like, I know when I was a kid watching this movie, it always gave me this very strange vibe. It's so weird because I do love it, and I do watch it every single year around Christmas. But I mean, you gotta admit, the facial expressions of these characters are a little bit odd. The hobo ghost on the train was creepy. The random puppets were horrifying. The empty Christmas town was eerie. I mean, I don't think I've ever watched this film to feel happy. It always left me with an eerie feeling. The film tells the story of a young boy who on Christmas Eve sees a mysterious train bound for the North Pole. He's invited on board by its conductor. The boy joins several other children as they embark on a journey to visit Santa Claus preparing for Christmas. Now, I feel like this movie plot sounds so happy, but there's just so much more to the movie than just that. By the way, did anyone else have the Game Boy game for this movie? I used to play this all the time, and I don't think I ever finished the game completely. They had some hard levels on there. Also, if you're super young watching this, you're probably like, Jesse, what the heck is a Game Boy? Don't worry about it. All right, so let's jump into the conspiracy theories. The first one is called the Hobo Conspiracy. Now, I just want to make it known that I'm not just randomly calling this character a hobo. This is what he's actually credited as. Just in case you're like, oh my gosh, Jesse, you can't just call people that. I know, but like that's his actual character name. So if you've ever seen the movie, I'm sure you can agree that this is a spooky and mysterious character. And people have always speculated that he's actually a ghost because of the way he acts and talks and the fact that he literally turns into snow before the train goes through the tunnel. He also asks the kid if he believes in ghosts, which basically gives it away. Well, this ghost theory was actually confirmed in a deleted scene that never made it to the movie. And this scene is called It Takes Two. And I'm pretty sure you can find this scene on YouTube. It's probably available somewhere. I just can't show it on here because copyright. In this deleted scene, the characters Smokey and Steamer explain to the boy in the form of a puppet show that the hobo rode on the roof of the train one Christmas Eve a long time ago and gets killed after it goes through Flat Top Tunnel. And they said that now his ghost rides the train every Every single year. Now, if this scene hadn't been cut from the movie, it would have been confirmed 100% sure that this character is a ghost. And there's also another theory saying that the hobo is actually Jack Frost rather than a ghost, just due to his ability to disappear and appear in the snow and how he's able to move on top of a moving ice covered train during a blizzard. I mean, like going around in the snow and being on top of this train seems really natural to him because it's winter, it's cold, and Jack Frost is able to do stuff like like that. He also calls himself the King of the North Pole, which would make sense because the North Pole is basically eternal winter. The hobo also seems to be sort of a mischievous being. Mischievous? <laughs> Did I say that wrong? And Jack Frost is also like that as well. He likes fooling around with people. He likes causing problems. So I don't know, comment down below. Do you think he's supposed to represent Jack Frost? Or do you think he was just a guy who literally died on the train and is now a ghost? Next, we have a conspiracy about the little boy. Now this boy is actually credited in the movie as Hero Boy. So whenever I mention Hero Boy, I'm talking about the little boy. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but Tom Hanks actually voices Hero Boy, the hobo, and the conductor. So he literally plays those three characters. I think he actually plays even more than those three characters in the movie. And you gotta wonder, why would they use the same voice actor for all of the characters? Because they had a really high budget for this movie. They could have afforded to have a bunch of different actors. People think that these three characters, the hobo, the boy, and the conductor have nothing to do with each other, but there's actually a very important reason why Tom Hanks voices all three. In this theory, the hobo represents the ghost of what would have happened to the hero boy had he never gotten on the train. People think he would have turned into this skeptical, bitter person who was constantly just stuck on the train forever trying to meet Santa. If Hero Boy had never gotten on, he would have become this bitter man and rode atop the train as he could never receive a ticket. The conductor, however, is another important part of the theory. He is determined to make sure that his train reaches the North Pole. And people say the conductor looks like the adult version of the boy. He is strict but kind and looks out for the 
Hero Boy. So it is believed that the conductor represents Hero Boy as an adult after riding the train. He also makes sure Hero Boy believes in Santa by the end of the trip. And like I said, his voice is the exact same as the Hero Boy. So it's kind of like the hobo and the conductor represents what could have happened depending on what the boy decided to do. I can kind of see that theory being true because they all kind of look the same, they have the same voice, but comment down below what you think. And the last theory we have is called the dream theory. People say that this whole movie is actually just a dream derived from a bedtime story. Because at the beginning, the boy is lulled to sleep with the Christmas tale. Hence Tom Hanks' voice being everywhere within it. Because apparently Tom Hanks also voices the dad in the movie. He voices so many things. And it says when dads read their kids' bedtime stories, they change their voice for different characters. So Hero Boy falls asleep to his dad telling him this story about the Polar Express. And then his dream takes off from there. And what really confirms this theory is the fact that the pocket of his robe breaks twice in the movie. The first time happened in his dream when his marbles spilled out of his pocket, and then the other time happened when he was awake. Obviously, your robe can't just rip twice, right? So it literally sort of confirms to audiences that one happened in the dream and one happened when he was awake, which shows the reality part of it. I hope this is all making sense. But those are basically the three conspiracies that I was able to find about this movie. If I missed anything, please comment it down below. And let me know if you ever thought this movie was a little bit eerie to watch. It's weird how you could love something but also find it scary at the same time. I'm probably gonna watch this movie tonight to be honest. I think before I get into the things you may not have noticed, I have kind of a question for all of you guys to answer right now. I want you to comment down below. Is Nightmare Before Christmas a Halloween film or a Christmas film? I feel like so many people around the internet, around the internet, I feel like so many people everywhere have just been confused and kind of torn between which one it actually is. A lot of people say both, but I feel like it's sort of more one than the other. I found a lot of articles online and I feel like people are directed more towards it being a Christmas film. And this is sort of someone's explanation as to why. In my opinion, it's a Christmas movie. Think about it. The story begins just as Halloween is ending, whereas a usual Halloween movie would hit its climax on Halloween. That's kind of true. When the movie starts, Halloween is ending. Like Halloween is over by the time the film is actually kind of getting into what's happening. And they move on to Christmas right away. So usual Halloween films take place place on Halloween, right? Like through the whole movie. But in this instance, it's Christmas most of the time. Also, the story involves characters learning the true meaning of Christmas, which is the most well-worn of all Christmas movie plots. But obviously, you can watch this movie whenever you want. If you want to watch it on Halloween and Christmas, you do you. I love that movie. I could watch it all year round, every day of the year. I'll watch it on Easter. <laughs> but yeah, I'm just so curious to know which one you think it more is, more of a Halloween movie or more of a Christmas movie. So one of the things that you might have missed in the film is that there are so many missing holiday trees. The holidays celebrated by the vast majority of human population go unrepresented, which I find a little strange. So if you're looking at a picture of all of these trees, it's only a few of the holidays that we're familiar with, but there's so many more that they missed. And like what I find so weird to think about is, okay, so Jack Skellington is in charge of Halloween Town, right? They always sort of have like a person in charge, like in Christmas Town, Santa's like in charge. So like for the turkey door for Thanksgiving, is the turkey in charge? Is there like this big turkey like walking around in charge of everybody? And what is the door with the firecracker on it? Like what does that mean? Is that the 4th of July door? And another thing that you might not have noticed is that the doors aren't lined up in chronological order. Like you'd think they might be in order, you know, of what time they come in the year. Cause like the turkey door is between Easter and Christmas, which doesn't happen in real life. So they're kind of just mixed up, which like isn't a big deal. You know what I mean? It just just makes you wonder like why. Another thing people were wondering is there's an entire town dedicated to Halloween. So, you know, Halloween town, but they don't celebrate Halloween the way that like us people are used to, like how Halloween is traditionally celebrated. Like their way of celebrating is lighting a skeleton on fire. <laughs> which 
you know, we don't do in real life. And you don't see them like trick or treating. Do you even see candy in Halloween Town? So it's just interesting how that town is supposed to represent what we know as Halloween, but they do things very differently. But then like in Christmas Town, they do things how we're normally used to it. So it's just, it's like a strange contrast there. And like candy is a big part of Halloween to like leave out. But maybe I just missed it. Maybe there is candy. Let me know down below. <laughs> the next question a lot of people have is how did Jack become the Pumpkin King? Like how is he? How was he the Pumpkin King? Was he forced to be the Pumpkin King? Because you know, when you listen to the song Jack's Lament, one of the lyrics in that song says, I'd give it all up if I only could. So it's almost like he was forced or maybe he was like born into it. I don't know. But it, he almost makes it seem like he has no choice. Like he has to be the Pumpkin King. And I would love to know the history behind that. You know what I mean? Like what's stopping him from giving it all up and like retiring as the Pumpkin King? Also the song implies that the Pumpkin King title has to go to the scariest resident of Halloween Town because he says in his song, there are few who deny at what I do I am the best. So like scaring people. And here's the thing that people are confused about. Maybe you are too. Do you think Jack is the scariest person in Halloween Town? Because personally, especially at the beginning of the film, I see so many scarier monsters. Like have you guys seen the thing hiding under your bed at the beginning of the movie? Or what about that creepy clown with the tearaway face? Like, a clown with a tearaway face. Like, to me, Jack is like, honestly, I'm not even gonna deny it. I had a bit of a crush on Jack when I was a kid. And like, how can you have a crush on a skeleton? But like, when you're a kid, you're like, oh, Jack, can I be your Sally? So like, to me, I thought Jack was like, really cool, not so much scary. But let me know what you guys think. Also, if Jack is the king of Halloween Town, why is there a mayor that's giving all of the orders? Like, why is there this annoying guy that's the mayor that's telling everybody what to do when clearly Jack is the king of Halloween Town? Halloween Town. Why isn't he the one giving the orders? You know what I mean? I never noticed that as a kid, but like watching it back, the, the mayor's like all in your face all the time, you know? The next point, why is everyone okay with the way Dr. Finkelstein treats Sally? Sally is basically a slave and she's held against her will, forced to do labor and spends much of the movie trying to escape from her cruel master. And that's already like a super messed up thing to think about. But what's even more messed up in my opinion is that everybody in the town is like aware of her situation. Jack is aware of her situation, but no one helps her. And Jack's a pumpkin king and he like is supposed to love her or like she loves him and they have they have a connection or whatever. And he doesn't like get her out of her situation. You know what I mean? Is no one concerned? I didn't like take that in until recently where I was like, wait, everyone knows. Jack knows, but yet she's still this slave who's like abused. Next point, why is Jack the only one who got bored of Halloween? So if you think about it, they spend the entire year preparing for this one one day of Halloween. So every day to them is Halloween, literally. Imagine like preparing for like Easter every day of the year. It would start to get like really tiring and really boring. And they've been doing this their whole entire lives, like everybody in Halloween Town. And Jack seems to be the only one curious of what else is out there. Don't you think more people would kind of like be like Jack and get bored quickly? Or is that just me? And listen, I love Halloween. I would love to celebrate it for like days on end, but like a whole year, <laughs> that's a lot. And like to not have any other holiday or not know anything different, it would get really overwhelming. Next point, how did nobody in Christmas Town notice a six foot skeleton running around? <laughs> he's literally running all over town, like jumping and singing and dancing. Like he's making himself known. He clearly doesn't look like he belongs there, but no one really seems to care or like say anything or look shocked. But I mean, maybe he just blends in with the snow. You know, he's white, snow's white, they just... They just mesh together maybe. So Jack says in the movie that he read all of the Christmas books so many times. Like he's done like his research on Christmas. Like he's read a ton as you guys could see. But then why does he call Santa Claus Sandy Claus? Like I'll put the name up here. He says Sandy Claus. He says his name completely wrong, but yet he's researched it so much. How does he get it wrong when he's been researching it? And oddly enough, it's Oogie Boogie that says Santa Claus's name right. But I mean, you also could say that maybe Maybe Jack says it as Sandy Claus because he's programmed in his brain to make everything scary. So even Santa Claus, who's supposed to be this like jolly, happy person, Jack in his mind just automatically makes him into a scary thing because he's from Halloween Town, you know? The next thing that you may not have noticed, did you realize that Jack went back into Halloween Town through a gravestone? 
when he was in Christmas Town. And I thought that the doors in the forest were the only way to get through each dimension. You know what I mean? But he went back through a gravestone. Like he casually just opens a grave and just like walks down into Halloween Town. So do all gravestones lead to Halloween Town? And the other question a lot of people have, if he goes down through a grave to Halloween Town, is Halloween Town actually HE double hockey sticks? You know what I mean? Is that what it actually is? Cause whoa, that's deep. Through researching, I found that a lot of people think that Jack Skellington is a little bit egotistical, which I can kind of see if I look back on it, but I still love him so much. Like, I love that guy. Like, he thinks he could do Christmas better than Santa Claus himself, who Santa Claus is literally Christmas, and Jack Skellington thinks that he can do it better than the, the man himself. And the fact that he's so quick to jump over to Christmas Town and take over everything makes me wonder if he's done that for any other holidays. You know what I mean? Because he it seems like he gets bored really easily. Maybe he's done that in different areas. Does he just get bored all the time and obsess over other places? Like, honestly, me though. <laughs> the next question. Why did Jack trust Lock, Shock, and Barrel to take care of Santa? Why not trust someone else that he knows and loves like Sally? Because Sally would never betray him. Like, those kids look so sketchy, so mischievous. No wonder they took Santa to Oogie Boogie. Because, like, how could you trust them? Why would Jack trust them? The other question is, why has nobody else found the holiday trees. Like nobody else in Halloween Town has ever mentioned them because when Jack stumbles across them, he's never heard of them, he's never seen them, he's like shocked to see them. And it's weird because when he found them, he had only been walking through the forest for I think one night. So it didn't even take him that long. Does no one ever walk through the forest and find them? Why is this not like a well-known thing? It's almost like Jack is just the only curious person around. Oh, and the other thing that people are noticing, which I never noticed as a kid either, how come Jack didn't exit the Halloween door tree and then like find himself in the circle of trees because he kind of just stumbles upon all the trees but if the Halloween door is in front of him why didn't he come out of it? Does that make sense? The next thing that people are noticing and asking questions about is what color is Sally's hair? Like what color is it actually? Is it brown or is it red? In the movie it looks dark brown like in every single scene. If you guys rewatch that movie or look at like clips or screenshots her hair is always like this dark brown color. But in all of the Nightmare Before Christmas merchandise and all of the Halloween costumes out there, her hair is this really, really bright red. But how come we don't see that bright red in the movie? Isn't that bizarre? That's like a conspiracy. Like it's actually making me like spiral into my brain. Like how is that possible? Every picture of her is dark hair. This might be a really weird question, but um, how can a skeleton blink? <laughs> because the way things blink is you have the, the fleshy part of your eyelid, right? Because that's not bone, so that's how you blink. But if he's a skeleton, he shouldn't be able to blink, but in the movie he blinks. Did you notice that as a kid? Because I noticed that now. The last question that you may not have noticed, and this like has no meaning at all really, but why does the spider on the mayor's shirt only have six legs, okay? It's bothering my OCD. Why, why don't they have all the legs on the spider? I feel like that's a weird question to end this video with, but like why? Anyways though guys, those are all the points that I have today. If you guys have have any more that I missed, definitely comment them down below. Let's jump into all of the very creepy conspiracies about the Grinch, but first we're gonna start with its history. How the Grinch Stole Christmas is a children's story by Dr. Seuss that was published in 1957. It follows the Grinch who is a grumpy, solitary creature who attempts to put an end to Christmas by stealing Christmas themed items from the homes of the nearby town called Whoville on Christmas Eve. But by the end of the book, miraculously, the Grinch realizes that Christmas may not all be about money and presents and his heart grew three sizes that day. I feel like every single person ever at least knows about the story. Now, what I find interesting is that this particular book was not the first time that people had ever seen this Grinch character. The Grinch actually first appeared in a 33 line poem by Dr. Seuss. And this poem was called The Hoobub and the Grinch and it was published in 1955. And here's what the Grinch looked like in that particular poem and how the Grinch stole Christmas. Was it even written? until a couple years later. And then in 1966, it was made into an animated movie, which is mainly the one we're gonna be focusing on today. But I'm sure most of you also know the live action film from 2000. I mean, to me, Jim Carrey will always be the best Grinch ever. Now, I was actually so surprised to find out through research that they actually made a Halloween Grinch movie back in 1982. Are you kidding me? It was literally called Halloween is Grinch Night. And why am I 
only hearing about this now? It tells the story of the Grinch making his way down to Whoville to scare all the Who's on Halloween. I literally need to find this somewhere and watch it right now. Another interesting fact is actually about the Fahu Foray song. The nonsense song which is sang during the movie was created to imitate Latin words. And when people first saw this movie, they thought they were actually singing in real Latin. And people started looking around for a translation, asking for it to be translated, but no, these aren't actually real words, it's just nonsense. All right, so let's jump into the first very eerie conspiracy theory. So the theory is that the Grinch was not only trying to steal Christmas away from the Who's, but he was also trying to wipe them out completely. He was trying to kill them. Now, the Grinch was originally part of a book series by Dr. Seuss, and one of the other books that he made was called Horton Hears a Who. In the book, Horton's friends try to destroy Whoville, which exists on only a speck of dust. And they're trying to destroy them because they don't believe it exists in the first place. So Horton therefore asks the residents of Whoville to make as much noise as possible so that his friends will finally acknowledge the town's existence and avoid killing them. So if you've ever read the book or watched the movie, the Who's literally have to start shouting, we are here, we are here, we are here. And it takes a lot of noise for them to finally be heard because they're literally just microscopic on this little piece of dust. So finally, Horton's friends hear them and decide not to destroy them. But here's the thing, in this theory, Whoville has lived in terror ever since that happened. You know, they're afraid that someone might accidentally step on them or eat them or just destroy them in general. And when we see the Who's two years later in How the Grinch Stole Christmas, they're immediately described as incredibly noisy people. And they're not just noisy at Christmas, they're noisy all the time. It seems like every single present that a kid in Whoville will get is some sort of noisemaker. They literally have tubas so massive that they take six people to play. They also have elaborate drums that play an entire kit at once. Here's an actual page from the book. It says, all the Who girls and boys would wake up bright and early. They'd rush for their toys and then, oh the noise, oh the noise, noise, noise. That's the one thing he hated, the noise, noise, noise. And if you really think about it, them making all that crazy noise is pretty reasonable because of the constant peril they are in from someone harming the speck of dust that they live on. That means they're not really making all this noise just to celebrate Christmas. Like I said, they're making the constant noise because they live in constant fear that at any moment, some random kangaroo might just come along and try to like throw them into a vat of oil just for a laugh. So here's how the Grinch's plot might have killed them all. It's not entirely clear what's wrong with the Grinch. He's obviously not the most educated person. He hears his fellow countrymen banging as loud as they can to keep their planet alive and he finds it annoying. So his whole plot to steal Christmas is kind of crazy because he's trying to put an end to the one thing keeping his species alive. When the Who's wake up to find they've all been robbed, they go out into the town square to sing carols. Now the Grinch thinks they're starting to sing because they just love Christmas, they're in the Christmas spirit, but they're actually singing because it's the last thing that will keep them alive. They have no more instruments or things to make loud noises with. So they're freaking out because their survival literally depends on these things. So yeah, when we were kids watching the movie, we thought, hey, they're starting to sing because they love Christmas. But no, they're singing because they'll die if they don't. And that's the whole really eerie conspiracy. It's that the Grinch wasn't just trying to end Christmas, he was trying to end them. The next theory is that the Grinch is actually a possessed who. Because if you look at him, he does have a similar face shape as the who's, you know, the tiny nose, the big mouth. It's just that he's hairy and green and has really red eyes. So the theory is that he's taken over by an evil spirit and his body is morphed and changed. Because when someone's possessed, that's kind of what happens. You change entirely the way you talk, the way you look, the way your body moves. It actually can get really creepy. And he's also able to do things like eat glass in the live action film. And he's pretty violent with himself in a lot of the scenes, but he never actually injures himself. It's like he never feels pain, he's always unharmed, and that's what happens when you're possessed. Like your body can do a lot of things that normally it can't. It could also explain why he wants to terrorize the town and take away everyone's happiness, because he's literally evil. And then at the end of the movie, Cindy Lou Who is the one who like brings him back to his normal self, because she's so innocent and pure. And her hugging him 
and being around him scares out the evil spirit and he's able to be himself again. Because obviously evil doesn't want to be around anything pure or good. And Cindy Lou Who is that. So yeah, this one's not a super long conspiracy, but I can kind of see what they mean. I can kind of see that. And the last creepy theory is that the Who's and Whovilles are actually cannibals. People say there's something strange about the shape and size of the roast beast. It's quite large and if you look at some of the sizes of the Who's, the roast beast looks really similar to their size and shape. People also say it's very vague to call something roast beast because what exactly is the beast that they're eating? And the theory goes that maybe the Grinch doesn't like the Who's because they're literally cannibals. Like maybe he doesn't agree with their way of life so this whole time we think the Grinch is this evil thing but really the Who's are evil. Like remember how there's one scene where the Grinch takes away the Who hash? Like what the heck is Who hash supposed to be? Like food is not usually named for who consumes it. Like if we go and buy cereal they don't call it human cereal. You know what I mean? You know when you go to the store you find things like corn beef hash because there's corn beef in it. So the fact that the Who's eat Who hash it insinuates they're literally eating Who's. So. And the theory says look at the Grinch. He already looks very different by his appearance. And if the Who's are willing to eat their own what's stopping them from eating someone a little different like the Grinch? And apparently the Grinch knew of this and that's why he ran away to be by himself because he did not want to be eaten. But then eventually they win him over with their hypnotic song. So this theory is literally saying that their song that they sing literally puts the Grinch into like this trance. And then at the very end of the book it says the Grinch himself even carved the roast beast. Which is a critical plot point apparently because it says he's fully assimilated now. Which means he's fully in their trance of like their cult like life. But it says but what happens the next time the Who's need to feast? Where do you think they will source their meat from? You know as well as I do, the Who's are gonna eat the Grinch. It says don't think they've forgotten what the Grinch did to them. No one forgives that easily. They're willing to eat their own, so they're more than certainly willing to eat an outsider, especially one who tried to ruin Christmas. And that's like basically this conspiracy theory. I think this one is the most far-fetched out of all of them. I feel like the first one I talked about is more realistic, at least me personally. But comment down below which ones you think are kind of legit, which ones you don't think are real at all. Let's first briefly talk about the 1966 version of The Grinch. It was called How the Grinch Stole Christmas because that is what this whole lost tape thing is about. This was an animated movie based off the book that came out in 1966 and this was actually the very first time a Dr. Seuss book was made into a TV special. Now I feel like at this point every single person watching knows what The Grinch is about but I'm gonna briefly summarize it one more time just so you can compare it to the lost tape version because it is similar but also very, very different and very scary. It is Christmas Eve in Whoville and everyone is decorating for Christmas except for the Grinch who lives in a cave on Mount Crumpet and his only companion is his dog, Max. So the Grinch just hates Christmas, especially all the noise that the Who's make. So he was annoyed with all of their rejoicing and celebrating. He was trying to bear through it for 50 years until finally he comes up with this plan to stop Christmas from coming. So he dresses up like Santa, makes Max look like Rudolph, off, puts together a sled and heads to Whoville to steal all of their presents. And then while he's at one of the first houses stealing their Christmas tree, a young girl named Cindy Lou Who wakes up and asks him why he's taking the Christmas tree. So the Grinch fibs his way out of it by telling her that one of the lights is broken and he's taking it to his workshop to fix. And then he just like calmly puts her back to bed and hopes that she forgets about it. Well, after stealing everything, the Grinch takes all of the presents and the decorations back up to Mount Crumpet. And he waits to hear all of the Who's crying, but instead they are happy and singing carols. It is at this point the Grinch realizes the true meaning of Christmas. His heart grows three sizes that day or whatever it is. And he brings everything back to the Who's and is invited to stay with them for the holidays, even carving the roast beast at the end. So it's just a really fun story. And obviously at the end it has this really heartwarming meaning and all is good and calm in the world. Well this does not happen in the Lost Tapes version. So there's this creepypasta that talks about one of the 
animators that worked on this movie getting fired. And he was so angry that he decided to take revenge on his team. And he made his own version of the Grinch movie that looked very similar to the one that we all know, but it changed ever so slightly towards the end. It was said that he made about 50 copies of this version and went around the states putting them in libraries and stores, basically in hopes that somebody would take it home and watch it thinking it was the real version when it wasn't. Now in this lost version, everything was the same, like I said, until about the middle-ish point of the movie when the Grinch decided to dress up as Santa to go to Whoville to steal all of the presents. He went to the first house and started stuffing up the tree in the chimney when he saw Cindy Lou Who. And that's when he got an awful idea, a very awful idea. He decided to throw her into the present bag as well. He thought that if this beloved little girl went missing, it would guarantee heartbreak and misery on Christmas Day. So he creeped up to her pretending he was Santa Claus and reached out his hand for her to take it. And when she did, he flung her into the air and into the bag of gifts. She was yelling and trying to escape, but it was no use. She couldn't get out. And all the outside world could hear was her muffled cries, not loud enough to alert anybody. Once he got all the gifts, he went back up to his mountain, ready to throw them over the edge. And that's when he saw all the Who's coming out of their houses calling for Cindy. Her parents were running around screaming and crying, and the Grinch thought the noise was even worse than the Christmas celebrating, because there's nothing like mourning, there's nothing like being afraid for a missing child. So he thought he would be getting rid of the noise, but he just made it even worse. Now, while the Grinch's back was turned, Cindy was able to finally poke her head out of the bag to look around, until she was able to slowly climb out. She ran towards the sound of people calling her name, but she didn't notice the steep edge of the cliff that she was on and she fell off and down, down, down she went. The snow curled around her until she was completely wrapped up in it, rolling down Mount Crumpet into this giant snowball. The snowball rolled right into town and stopped right in front of her parents. There's your little Cindy, the Grinch called down to them. And the movie ends with all of the people trying to claw her out of this giant snowball as fast as they can. But then the screen cuts to black, insinuating that they probably wouldn't have been able to get her out on time. Now, the creepypasta says that a few of these lost tapes still exist to this day, and because they are so rare, some of them are selling for $500,000. Now, of course, this story is only legend, or so people think, but one could never be too sure the extent someone would go for revenge. And it's actually crazy how many, like, lost tapes creepypastas I've read that stem from someone in the animation studio being fired and then making like a revenge version of the TV show or of the movie so it would scare kids. How horrible is that? Like imagine going to a movie store thinking you're going to just rent The Grinch. Oh, you love this movie. I mean, I watch it every single year. And then I turn it on and I watch Cindy Lou Who dying inside of a snowball. Yeah, no, that is absolutely terrible. But yeah, like I said, it is only supposed to be a creepypasta, but still be careful. If you notice the movie taking a strange turn, turn it off. Don't, uh, don't continue watching that. Comment down below which version of The Grinch is your ultimate favorite. I always love the Jim Carrey version, the live action version, and I'm probably gonna watch that this week now that I've done this video. <laughs> This tragic story is about a little girl named Molly who was obsessed with the Grinch movie, specifically the one from 2000 starring Jim Carrey. And I also personally think that that movie is superior. Like it's better than all of the other Grinch movies. But she would watch it every single year at least 10 times after it started snowing for the first time. And it would drive her parents absolutely crazy. She knew every word and scene by heart. Her room was full of of Grinch merchandise. Her bed spread had his face on it. Her pillows were green and fuzzy. She had posters all over her walls. It was safe to say that it was her favorite movie ever. By the way, we have Grinch hats and Grinch scarves on our website as well. I forgot to mention that. So I'm sure everyone has seen this movie or at least has heard of it or heard the song. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. And like I said, I've made two or three Grinch movies over the past couple years. But just in case you've never heard of this and you're living on like planet Mars or something, let me give you 
a brief summary. The Grinch is a green creature with a heart two sizes too small who lives alone in a cave atop Mount Crumpet, located above the village of Whoville. He especially hates Christmas and has always been annoyed by the town's Christmas celebrations. One Christmas Eve, he finally decides to stop Christmas Day from coming to Whoville by disguising himself as Santa Claus, and he steals all the presents and decorations. Then he goes to the top of Mount Crumpet, ready to just throw them off the side of the mountain. When he hears the Who's in Whoville celebrating and still being happy even though they lost everything, so his heart grew ginormous, he brought everything back to them, and he celebrated with them. So it's like a heartwarming story. But let's get back to our story about Molly. One day she was walking through the neighborhood with her dad when they passed a garage sale, and sitting on a table right next to the sidewalk was a VHS tape of the 1966 Grinch. Now her father had this really old VHS tape player in his basement, so he asked her if she wanted to get the movie because she had never seen this version before. She was always watching the Jim Carrey version, which I understand, but her father wanted a break. Her mother wanted a break. <laughs> they wanted her to watch something else for a change. So she agreed and they took the movie home. She watched it two times in a row that evening and even begged to watch it one more time before bed, but her parents told her she needed to take a break, go to bed, and she can watch it again in the morning. While she was being tucked in by her mom, she looked outside her window and began to point at the forest outside their house and was jumping up and down on her mattress. When her mom asked her what she was pointing at, Molly said, The Grinch is out there. He's waving at me. I think he wants me to go say hi to him. So Molly's mother told her that there was nothing out there, but Molly replied with, Don't be silly. I saw his green hand out there. Her mom just shook her head and put her to bed, but the next morning they had a very heartbreaking discovery. Their daughter was gone. She was missing from her bed. Her bedroom window was wide open. So they called the police and got a search party together and they walked through the woods for hours calling out her name. They had never felt such fear before. Molly was missing for 36 hours and every hour felt like an eternity for her parents. They could not believe it when she suddenly showed up at the back door of their house, shivering, covered in snow. But what she told them next was even scarier. She said that in the middle of the night, she heard her name being called and when she looked out the window, she saw the Grinch's green furry hand in the darkness of the forest. He was basically beckoning her to him. So she climbed out her window and wandered into the forest. She said the green hand kept appearing out from behind trees and kept getting farther and farther into the forest the longer she walked towards it until she no longer knew where she was. She wasn't paying attention to where she was going. She was just enamored by this Grinch hand. She said the Grinch's hand was holding a beautiful shiny red ornament like he did in the movie and she so desperately wanted to grab it but she could never get close enough. And what's strange is that she never fully got a glimpse of the Grinch himself. She only ever saw his hand. She began to get scared that she was very lost, so she ran in the direction that she thought her house was. But it took her an entire day to find it. But now she was finally back home being warmed up with a blanket. Her parents tried to explain to her that it was impossible that she actually saw the Grinch. But she was just convinced that she had no one could tell her otherwise. Police went back to search through the forest for any clues, and after a few more hours they came across a pair of bright green fuzzy mittens lying in the dirt. And they knew immediately in that moment that someone had been watching Molly for weeks. They knew that she loved the Grinch and they tried to lure her out of her bedroom at night wearing mittens the same color, the same texture, to look just like the Grinch that she knew and loved. He must have gotten spooked when police arrived and took off deeper into the forest, leaving behind all the proof they needed. And that is the end of this very creepy story. So this whole time that I was reading this, I was was like, oh, it's actually like the Grinch. It's like a creepy creature version of him. But no, it was just a person trying to lure this kid out of her house. And I always say, sometimes people are scarier than any ghost or creature that you can think of. And it just makes the story more realistic. And I hope this never happens in real life. I do believe this is just fictional. I hope so at least. But it's still really creepy and I still wanted to tell it because I know that you guys love the Grinch. I love the Grinch. But at least at least it wasn't actually him. We love him. He didn't actually do this. 
Hey guys, it's Jessie V and I'm here with Mandy V. Hey guys, I'm so sorry. I look like a mess right now. I'm in the middle of moving. That's why I haven't been posting that much on my channel, but like everything's super chaotic. It's almost Christmas. I have to put up the Christmas decorations and all that. So I look like a crazy person right now. She looks fine. Cause she looks, <laughs> she looks so good and I look beat. So she looks just fine. Anyways, today, I don't even know if you know what we're doing today. It's Christmassy, right? It's Christmassy. So today we're gonna be talking about it's kind of like a thing that we usually do We are gonna be talking about the Christmas movies that creeped us out as children and these aren't horror movie like Christmas themed horror movies These are movies that when we look back on gave us really weird vibes or made us feel not necessarily afraid But like weird, you know, when you just get a weird vibe. This is the Polar Express <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what movies you wanted to do but like I thought of a bunch of mine that I think you'll relate to as well For me, it's Polar Express like that's what we're starting with good great. But if you think about that anything is, else that is I actually have a few things I'd like to say about that I just watched it with Luca So the Polar Express we saw in theaters a long time ago when the heck did it come out? We were little Polar Express and it was like a huge deal because it was like new like a new phase of animation that we haven't been like introduced to oh, yet. Yeah. Even though looking like now watching it, it's like the worst animation ever. But like back then it was a huge it thing. It was a big deal. It was actually a huge deal. Yeah, everyone was talking about industry. it. It was on the news. Like everyone wanted to go see it. We took our entire family. It came out in 2004. So I was in grade four, Mandy was in grade two. So Whoa. it was a long time ago. <laughs> Only 56% on Rotten Tomatoes? What the heck? Rotten Tomatoes is really hard on movies though. I don't agree with that. Anyways, I know from my personal experience watching it, even as an adult now when I see it, I still get that very strange vibe. I can't even explain how I feel when I it's watch it. It's just eerie. It's eerie. It's supposed to be a happy Christmas movie and I always feel, it's not scared, it's like weird. Like the part where they go to the Christmas, the Christmas town and it's like deserted. I always feel so gross. <laughs> It's so hard to explain. Yeah, I, there's an eerie feeling and I, I don't know if it's because of like the message that they're trying to bring across. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's the obvious with like the puppets and the creepy homeless man and like everything's everything that is meant to be creepy is creepy but it's yeah. also like the idea of like him going on the Polar Express and getting to the Christmas At night. town and not being able to hear the bells and everybody yeah. else hears them except for him. And I it's just like, feel like anxiety inducing. <laughs> yeah, it is. It actually is because it's just like, what the heck? I love the movie because it's all like seeing isn't always believing. Yeah. You know, and, and I love the whole thing with the bell. Like it's a beautiful movie, but it's just, there's something about it that has like this dark. Like an off It's a vibe. tone. Yeah. It's a dark tone. Almost like Tim Burton-y. Yeah, I do like the specific scene that I hated as a kid was the puppet scene when they go into that carriage part with the puppets I hated that that's the one scene I can think of like off the top of my head but are you done with what you're saying yeah okay <laughs> so I I actually am gonna br I was gonna make <gasps> dad <laughs> that me. wait I just wanna like, he heard us filming don't knock over just, my backdrop I just wanna stay like right here can we're I talking sit, can dad, I sit down we're talking about the polar express remember when you oh, took yeah, us to yeah. that yeah. In okay yeah. wait I have something I wanna 3D, say 3D 3D I have something I wanna say okay go for it I was gonna make my own personal video just about the polar express no way that's like was... really scary what you guys are looking no, at no wait it's a puppet on the screen. Wait, I was gonna make my own personal video because I learned a lot of stuff about the movie. Mm -hmm. So, okay, and you I'm... need to watch it again because it'll make more sense. Okay. But the homeless man in the movie. It's really scary. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna make my own video about it. I'm gonna make my <laughs> okay. own video. Go so, to Mandy's channel. channel. Link take, down below. It'll take too long. It'll take too long. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. Me, me trying to express myself and have my moment. Okay, bye. I just recently watched it, so I realized something, and I searched into it, and there's so many conspiracy theories really? on who he is. <gasps> and we're not gonna go into it now because it's gonna take way too long. Because I can see that there's a lot here that we're gonna cover. <laughs> There's a lot I can see here. There's a lot. There's a lot that she wants to cover. <laughs> but I'm gonna make my own video about the Polar Express. So if you guys want to hear more about that, head over to you my channel. You have to do that soon, then. Okay. The next one is Frosty the Snowman from the 1960s. Okay. Demonic. Wait. Demonic. No, no, no. no. 
demonic. I don't even look at any conspiracy theories, no nothing. Luca is a big fan of Frosty the Snowman and he put it on and I was like, turn off, turn off, turn off. Look at that face. I'm sorry. No, but what I wanted to talk about was he has his before he's animated face, like before he comes alive. This is his face and there's a gif. That's what he looks like before he comes alive. I know. Alive. And then like, I hate it. When I was a kid and I watched this, like the, the music is great. Like thumpity, thump, thump, no, thumpity, no, no. thump, thump. Look it's at literally, Frosty, can you, have you a Searched up conspiracy theories about Frosty because I'm not the only one who thinks that. We don't have time for this. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of yeah. people who have covered it. You know what? You should do a conspiracy video okay, of a bunch of them, I not will. just Polar Express. I will because I feel like there's so much you can talk about, especially yeah. like older films. The older the movie, the creepier it is because mm -hmm. there's so many deep, hidden, subliminal That's true. things going on. Even in Disney movies, which I've gone exactly. over before. A Christmas Carol? I don't care what version, the one from the whatever this is, the 80s, any of the versions, the three ghosts that come have always freaked me out since I was a kid. Okay, straight up, which which is the one that we used to watch? The cartoon. The old We old watched one. the cartoon, but we also watched this one. You have to get the one that's the one that we grew up on, the cartoon from like the VHS one. This one. <laughs> There's so many versions. Oh, no. Charles Dickens. Oh wait, is well, that that's the all, that's, that's, that's the guy everyone. Who, oh, okay. <laughs> I just don't like the ghost. It's scary. Okay, Why? Let me say, the ghost of Christmas future. The Grim Reaper? Are you kidding? The ghost? <laughs> are you kidding? Like that's gonna give children nightmares. These I'm are sorry. really scary images. The ghost of Jacob Marley. There's so many ghosts and like why okay, would but they the do ghost that? of Christmas past okay I have to say something it's I depressing. have to say something about everything the a Christmas Carol is a very 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 good message oh for sure a very good it's like deep Dude. But when you're a kid, you don't get it. Okay, but when you're like a spiritual person, think about it. Like, he's living his life so wrong. Yeah. And he's such a horrible person, a greedy, selfish person. And his partner, who had died, is literally living in purgatory with chains and all these things because of the way he lived his life. Yeah. So he comes to him to warn him. Like, that's so intense. Like, imagine that. But that's scary. That's life. Ghosts shouldn't come on Christmas, you know what I mean? Like, when you're a kid, you want to watch but a happy life. movie. If you were somebody like Scrooge, like a angry, <laughs> relatable, selfish person, <laughs> this is a movie for you, y'all. Yeah. And then like it's the Christmas past, so like he's warning him, like this is this is where I am because of Christmas future. If he, the ghost of Christmas future, if he continues on the path that he is, he is going to go to a not so good place. Starts with an H, kids. H E double hockey stick. Okay, it's not a good situation. <laughs> for the last thing I'm gonna say about this is that the Muppets Christmas Carol <laughs> is the best. No wait, the wait, shadow of no, the wait. No, 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 no. The Mickey Mouse one though, where Goofy's the one on the chains and he's like tripping over his chains. Can we please watch the video? Christmas cold. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Why is your hair all over me? My eye is watering so much. <laughs> Oh okay. Like if there was a ghost that was gonna come to me, I'd want it to be goofy. This Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> they wouldn't have known. Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. The claymation one. Yeah. This was from the yeah. 1960s. <laughs> 1960s. And Grandma and Grandpa used to show this movie to us, and this is how I developed my favorite Christmas songs. <laughs> so this is not a scary like, movie. No, not at all. The old claymation where they move like this. Move like this. <laughs> you don't move like this. Ew. Jack Frost, 1998. It's supposed to be a comedy, and I totally get that and respect that. <laughs> <laughs> I get the idea, but you didn't come through that way. If it my, did not come through. If my father turned into a snowman. <laughs> Oh, it's his dad? Yeah, I think so. I think it's his dad. Are you sure? Anything that has to do with snowmen coming alive, I'm sorry. That's not okay. No, it's his dad. Turns into a snowman. People are gonna hate me for this. Narnia. Love it. Love it. It's a great movie. It is a little creepy. Always had a very weird vibe. Always. Just watching it. I think it was mainly the forest parts. I always had such a weird vibe. You know what's funny that you say that? Is that, like, that moment right there, yes, it's creepy and eerie, because there's something about... 
an empty snowy forest, but there's also something really beautiful about it. This part is the only part of Narnia I'd ever go to. But it's so eerie in the fact that the trees watch them and like they're always being watched. Well, it's creepy because of the Snow Queen. The last thing I want to talk about is Home Alone and as good of a movie as it is, it's the best. when I was a kid, thinking about intruders coming in my house freaked me out so much and the fact that no matter what he did, they get hurt so badly. Like people have done videos about how they should have died doing so many things and they did it. Oh yeah. That, I hated that as a kid watching movies where you try to like hurt someone or get them out of your house and they just keep, they don't die. I for one love home. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting so tired. Yeah. The beginning of the video was so like, I'm and tired the Polar and I'm Express hungry. conspiracy theories and now we're sitting here like, I'm yeah. tired and I'm hungry. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Alright, so let's start with the history of Frosty the Snowman. Alright, so everybody knows the classic Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer song, right? I hope you do. This song came out in 1949 and immediately people loved it. It's just super catchy and it's just become one of those classic Christmas songs even to this day. It also had a really good moral and message. It's about one of Santa's reindeers that had a huge glowing red nose and all of the other reindeers would laugh at him because he didn't look like them. But one Christmas, Santa Santa asked Rudolph to guide his sleigh so they could see in the dark. And the moral is don't make fun of people who are different because everyone has something to offer no matter what. And I always really love that message, you know? Anyways, because this song did so, so well, the same writers decided to make another song called Frosty the Snowman. And they just hoped that this song would be just as popular as Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And it definitely was. This song was recorded in 1950 and it's about a snowman who was brought to life by a magical silk hat that a group of children find and place on his head. Now, they originally had made this black and white short film to go with this song, and the screenshots I was able to find of this is actually really creepy. If I was a kid watching that, I would see Frosty in my nightmares. And then in 1969, they came out with a longer color version, and I think this is the one that most people are familiar with. Like, my sister and I definitely grew up watching this specific movie around Christmas time. And even if you watching have never seen the movie, you at least know the song, right? Right? Everyone at least has to know the song. I actually heard these rumors that they're making a live action Frosty the Snowman. And Jason Momoa is supposed to be the voice of Frosty. Is that even real? I like found this during my research and I was like, no. All right, so let's get into the creepy Frosty the Snowman conspiracy theories. So the main creepy conspiracy about Frosty the Snowman is that he's an evil spirit and the happy facade he has is just a cover-up. And I'll definitely explain all that in a moment. I feel like I'm about to ruin Christmas for everybody. I hope you still love me after this. So if you listen to the song, you know that Frosty the Snowman was made on a very hot day, which most likely meant that winter was over and spring was beginning. So we can assume that Christmas had already passed by the time the kids start building Frosty. Well, the kids use coal as Frosty's eyes, which is a little bit strange. You gotta think, why would these kids conveniently just have chunks of coal with them. The theory is that these children are the naughty kids, and because of that, they received coal in their stocking for Christmas. Because as you know, Santa only gives the behaved kids presents, and these kids must have been really horrible and up to no good to only receive coal. It is thought that these kids wanted to basically cause chaos in their town by summoning this evil spirit to go into the snowman. So they do a ritual which involves holding hands in a circle around him and using cursed items like the hat they put on his head. And then he comes to life. And I don't know about you guys, but this movie never really sat well with me. It's not like I thought Frosty was like an evil spirit when I was a kid, but just everything about the way Frosty looked and acted and spoke just gave me weird vibes. The movie was never like really heartwarming. Like I was never super excited to watch it or anything. Anyway, the movie continues with the kids following Frosty wherever he goes, kind of like they're worshiping his every move. And then because he is said to be evil, Evil, he keeps putting these kids in dangerous situations, like walking right across the road into traffic and disobeying a police officer. And did you notice that everyone in the town is terrified of Frosty? And the kids are the only 
ones who aren't. Like, people are literally passing out from fear after seeing him. He also encourages one of the little girls to go with him to the North Pole, which literally almost kills her. Like, she gets hypothermia, passes out. It's actually quite dark. I don't know why they wrote the movie that way. Why would a friendly, lovable snowman want to cause such danger? And the answer in this conspiracy is that if it's a dark spirit, they don't care, right? Like, they just want to do evil things. Also, before the movie ends, Frosty tells the kids that he will return again next year, which honestly is kind of ominous. It sounds exactly like something an evil spirit would say before leaving you. I'll be back. Anyway, all of this is just a conspiracy. It's not anything that I came up with personally. This is all research that I found online that people believe. Now, I do think it's a little bit far-fetched. Do I think that Frosty is actually an evil being? No, I don't think so. Do I think the movie is a little bit strange? Definitely. And I think the movie actually takes place just before Christmas, so it cancels out all those previous conspiracy facts about it being after Christmas. But still, regardless of how accurate these conspiracies are, they still freak me out. And if I missed any good facts or any other creepy things that Frosty does, definitely comment them down below. 